All right. Good morning. Hey. You guys got to do better. Look around. You're making up for a lot of empty spaces. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. We'll grow into it. Good morning, everybody. It's really good to be here. Welcome to Pine Grove Community Church. It's good to be back. Man, it's, it's strange. It's still, this is weird for me. Last week, we were away at our junior high uh, retreat, which was so good, and God's really been working, and I missed church, but it seems like a long time when you're not here for two weeks, but I don't really have a lot of, as far as announcements goes, I do want to just remind you of a couple things. First of all, we have the bulletin for a reason, so it's, uh, check that as far as what's coming up this week, and the second thing is, we just want to remind you, I don't know if they, I don't know if this has actually been said yet. But we're trying to start something new in the parking lot area um, in terms of like traffic flow because now that KFJ during the second service, the kids are actually meeting over there in that other building, they're going to be dropped off right in front of those doors. So what we're asking is that everybody that's leaving, leave out the back of the parking lot, okay, so that we have sort of an entrance to the parking lot and then go out the back toward the, you know, the Pleasant Valley homes around that way. Does that make sense? That way, when people are dropping off their children, there's not like, you know, either that or just zoom right by them and scare everybody. It's your choice. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't do that. That would be weird. Uh, but yeah, so as far as like announcements go, here's something weird. I'm pretty sure that's all that I have to say. I know it's a short idea. <laughs> Who just clapped? <laughs> so we're going to go for a record and I'm not going to add anything. Uh, really excited about this morning, and I just want to, before we pray, and just like acknowledge that, yes, your thing's in the bulletin. Ah, okay, if you would like to be part of uh, like putting together this year's Sportsman Banquet, um, which is a really awesome outreach, doesn't happen to wait until March, but like this is something that takes a lot of planning, coordination, and preparation. If you'd like to be a part of making that happen or volunteering, uh, there is a meeting tomorrow. See Brad back there, uh, or his number is in the is in the bulletin about that. So, but I forgot to put the time in there. Seven. That's what we're missing. The offering. That's strange that we're not passing in the offering. Sorry, we're, I'm still adjusting as well. There is that the treasure chest back there. Yeah, that's what it looks like. So put your treasures back there in the box, and then someone can open it up, and there's like a little golden light that comes on when you open it, so it's like, whoa. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, this morning, when we, uh, before we start, I just want to, I just want to like remind us, I guess is the word, that when we pray, this is a spiritual privilege that we have. And just like, just like the Bible tells us, if we really, uh, if we have faith that what we're asking for is something that God can say yes to, and we believe that He has the power and the will to 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 answer our prayers, then He will. So this morning, if we are willing to say, "Lord, please help me to be a different person when I leave here," help me to understand, help me increase my faith, that He will absolutely answer those things, and I think that's worth asking for. So if you're willing, go ahead and close your eyes, and I'm just going to offer the words and just like pray in your, in your soul uh, with me. Sovereign Lord, we are so grateful for the truth that we have, that we have something concrete, something solid to stand on in our lives, your love, your word, the true history of the world. And an incredibly detailed plan of the future. And most of all, Lord, we're just so grateful for all the hope that we have. In any season, in any part of life, in any stage of history, we know who we are because we know who you are. And we're so grateful for that. Thank you for the security and the confidence that you've given us. And thank you for the life and the death and resurrection of your son. The culmination of all history and all of the Old Testament being pointing to, toward your son and that we get to benefit from, from having your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, by that spirit, I just pray this morning that you would teach me. That you would speak to us so that, you know, simply because we love you, and we want to know you more, and we want to we love you better. In the name of your son, we pray. Amen. All right, let's praise God. All right. Woo! Good morning. Bob said I should say surprise. 
because I, I'm teaching today. So, boy, I can't, I love that song. I love it, love it, love it. And I can't wait to stand with every nation and tribe. Every language is going to be there by the throne saying he's worthy. I can't wait for that day. Hey, um, good morning. Uh, we're going to be in two specific passages of scripture today. So if you have your copy of the word of God in your hands, can you turn there? Can you t- take a second and turn there? You know that I feel passionately about this, that I love it that we can put scripture on the wall, and it's just as real if it's on the wall as it is if it's in this book. But the problem is nobody is taking the wall home with them. So if we can see it in God's word, that goes home with us, and that is why I'd like you to turn, if you can, to Colossians chapter 1 and put something in there, and then turn to Genesis chapter, not Genesis, Exodus chapter 14, put something in there. And actually, I should have said the other way around because we're going to start in Colossians, okay? Not one person said, okay. okay. That's what's cool about teaching little kids when you go, and you know what? And they go, What? When, okay, yeah. All right. And while you're turning there, I do want to say that Bob invited me and asked me if I, if I would teach this section of our next part in the story of Exodus. And I just want to remind you that it is my heart's desire to be a biblical woman. And so when he asks me to stand and talk, I want to remind you that I don't come because I have any authority. It's only by the authority of the Word of God and my confidence is in the Spirit of God. Okay, so that's just, that's what it is. And I just want to acknowledge that right away, that it's not in a, anything else. Um, okay, are you there? If you're there, you're there. Okay, that's start. Um, so last week we left the children of Israel where? The Red sea. Yes, exactly. Right parked beside the Red Sea. And just so we remember that the Red Sea is a long and basically fairly uh, nearly north-south running body of water between the present day Saudi Arabia on the east and Egypt and Sudan on the west. And you're like, who cares? Because it's a real place, okay? We don't know exactly what it looked like because of erosion and things in, in this back in Exodus, but it's really there, okay? It's not just a swamp land. It's, a, it's a, something that we would call a sea, okay? And there they are, two and a half million people with their cattle and the possessions and everything that they, were, that they brought with them um, from Egypt. And remember, when we see them, they're there beside the Red Sea. They're literally hemmed in, basically. The sea is there, and Pharaoh is coming towards them. And what comes to the surface? Do you remember? What comes to the surface? Fear. Fear and one more thing. Anger. When they get in that pressure cooker, what comes to the surface shows what's really still in their hearts. It's fear, and their fear turns to anger. Like, I can't believe you did this to us. Why could you do this to us? Fear and anger come to the surface. And last time, last week Bob talked, he raised so many questions, and I think they're good questions. Why would they say it is better in Egypt? Was it? No, it was horrible in Egypt. Why? But why would they say that? Why would their minds instantly think that? And why didn't they believe that the God who brought them out of bondage could deliver them now? Right? Doesn't that make sense? If God had all that power to bring them out, then why couldn't he deliver them now? It seems like it's not quite logical. But the answer is actually very logical and very simple. And I think it helps us to understand any form of bondage. Any form. And that's actually what we're going to talk about today, is how do, how do we continue walking away from bondage? And I, I do want to pause right now and think, okay, what would be your t- certain brand of bondage? Now you're like, I, you haven't probably actually been in slavery But it could be, and we're going to give some examples later, but it could be all manner of things that kind of draw us back. And all of those things have in common one thing, is that will draw us back. It will draw us back. And that's what, that is the answer. The bondage was calling them back. 
When we're in the middle of it, the bondage feels like a prison cell. And the longer we stay in that bondage, the more we both learn to love it and hate it. You're like, love it? What are you talking about? Hate it is obvious, right? Because it's holding us back from moving forward. We don't have freedom. And so we hate that it's holding us. But we also learn to love it because it feels familiar. It feels predictable. It feels controlled. It feels controlled. But then a rescuer comes and he flings open the gate, the, the prison doors, and he sets us free and we step out and our debt is paid and just feel it. I'm free. This music was awesome. I mean, there is so much truth, maybe because I know I'm getting ready to stand up and I know what I've been preparing and I know I'm like, yes. So there's so many truths we already sang about today. He has set us free. Oh, I love it. Okay, so that's, that's going to take us right to Colossians. Remember, you're right there. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. It tells us what he did. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. He has set us free. But sadly... And this is true, it's only a matter of time before we look back. And the familiar cell allures us. What's a synonym for allure? It like entices, it calls, it draws. And we, it draws us back to bondage again. So what are we free from? We sang it. We're free from the chains of sin and death. We've been given new life, and we're free to actually live in that life. Not free to sin, but free from sin's control. Men and women of God, we must not go back to what we were set free from. No matter what the circumstances in front of us. And this is the message. God will make a way to walk away. Always, he promised he would. Further from the cell. Further from the prison cell. Always walking away. Galatians 5.1. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. The New Living Translation reads, now make sure you stay free. It's God's plan that you be free and that you move which direction? Forward, Forward in your freedom. Not back into bondage. We need to keep walking in and toward freedom. And still we stand in their shoes. We stand with them, with those Israelites, and we say, but I can't. I can't. The present is unbearable and the future is impossible. And I'm mad about it. You, you ever been there? The present is unbearable, and the future is impossible, and I'm mad. I'm mad about it. And what is God's answer to them? Do you remember in Exodus, what was his answer when they got mad? He said, all you got to do is be still, because I'm going to fight for you. Remember that? Be still. What in the world did he mean by that? Well, we know he didn't mean physically be still, although sometimes that is what he asks us to do. But that isn't what he was going to ask them to do because in just a little while, they're going to do some serious speed walking. Okay? But what he is asking them to do is be still in your mind. Your thoughts. You been there? Fear and anger and your thoughts are racing and racing and racing and keeping you up at night. And be still in your thoughts. Be still. 
your emotions. You ever try to still your emotions? Be still. <laughs> I have to insert this, but every once in a while, if I feel like ex extra stressed about something and I'm working really hard and rushing around, you know what I'm going to say right now. Bob will say, just relax. And you know what? That makes me want to just kill him. <laughs> it doesn't really help. Not really. I, maybe I should edit that in case I really don't want to kill you. I like you. Okay. But God says, be still in your emotions. Be still in your soul. Be still. And we listen to that and we hear that and we say, yes, because God's going to fight, me, fight for me so I can be still. But how? Can somebody please tell me how? How am I supposed to do that? That's what today is going to be about. How? Okay. So the first thing, and okay, I know this is, this is kind of tricky because there's, we're going to use three words. They're just single concepts because I want you to be able to remember them. I want you to be able to, when you're standing between the devil and the deep blue sea, to be, yes, there, okay, anyway, that is actually a song, okay, anyway. Um, when you're standing there that you can say, okay, what am I supposed to do? Boom, boom, boom. Doesn't make it easy to do it, but it does make it easier to remember it. Okay? First thing that we're going to remember is this. Think. 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 It matters what we think. In that moment when the Red Sea is there and Pharaoh's army is there, it matters what we think. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5 says, For although we live in the world, and we do, right? Most of us. Okay? We do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the on contrary, they are. They have divine. What's divine mean? God's power of God, divine power to demolish strongholds. Picture prison cells to demolish them. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive, captive every thought. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. It matters in that moment of fear and doubt and confusion and sinking what we think. We have to take our thoughts. So here is where I want us to first start with our thinking. When we look at our bondage, when you look back at your bondage, make sure you think about it truthfully. The bondage, it could be fear that binds you, like fear, or maybe it's addiction, or the patterns of thinking that twisted and muddled the truth, and you don't feel like you have clarity because everything's all twisted and muddled, or that old and familiar and destructive way of dealing with people in your life. It's familiar those thoughts are familiar. That bondage is familiar, but think about it truthfully. You never controlled it. It controlled you. Think about it truthfully. And let's not be deceived. And this, this breaks my heart because I hear this coming out of Christians' mouths. People who call themselves free in Christ have believed this, that familiarity and freedom are the same thing. It feels right, so it must be what freedom looks like. Or that something that comes naturally must be right and best. <sighs> because it is the path of least resistance should be a red flag to us, that that is the road back to bondage, not away. Think of your bondage truthfully. How did it work for you? It was a cell. Think, think. God provided Moses. Was Moses the enemy? Were they acting like he was? Are you there? <laughs> were they acting like Moses was the enemy? Yes, they were. They were angry at Moses. But the truth is, God provided Moses. 
or whoever is helping me walk away from the cell. God provided them. They're not my enemy. Satan is my enemy. Think truthfully about who the real enemy is. Think this situation is flat out out of my control. But it's not out of God's. And think God is my guide and my protection. Now, I know those are easy things to say, but we need to remember to set our mind on those, to think on those things. That's got to be where it starts, in our mind. What are we going to think? By the way, who led them where they were? Where are they again? The Red Sea's here. The army of, of Egypt is coming down hard on them. Where are they? They're in a horrible, impossible place. And who took them there? God specifically took them there. It even says in Scripture that they could have gone this other way, but God took them toward the Red Sea. God took them there. Charles Spurgeon points out they had not come there undirected, and they would not be left unprotected. So they need to think, who brought me here? Think. God will never lead you to a place where God will fail you. Now, I know what I just said. It sounds like some nice words, okay? But it is a choice. If we are going to be free and live free, we need to think and speak truth to ourselves. We need to think. Colossians 1.9 Hopefully you're still there. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to do this, to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives you. Think that he would fill you with what? Knowledge so that you would know what's true, that you would be able to think. So so I... Every time that we're in that pressure cooker, every time that our relationships are in conflict, every time that we feel fear coming up to control us and emotions coming up to control us, our addictions from the past coming up to control us, stop and think, what is the truth in this? So I have a question for you. First of all, did, do, do you have in your mind the thing that tends to draw you back? Now, I'm not, I'm not implying that we're all like running back to bondage right in this moment, okay? I am convinced that every one of us has something that draws us back. Like the old hymn says, I'm prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. We are prone to wander back to the cell. What, what is your form of bondage? Don't say it out loud. But do you know it in your head? Do you know what it is? Now, second question is, in regard to that, what truth do you need to speak to yourself in that? When you feel your heart and your emotions and your will being drawn back there, what truth do you need to speak to yourself in that? And you might say, Vicki, I don't know. I don't know what to think. Here is what I think. And you know what? I'm I'm hearing you say that it's not true. Well, then I don't know what to think. Too bad. So where do we do with that? I like classes better than this setting because then you could answer me just now. You know what? I know this is going to sound like a pastor's wife kind of thing, but it's a true kind of thing that we need to expose ourselves to the truth. We need to go where we have our minds transformed. And where would that be? Absolutely, the Word of God. Because it's the living Word of God, and He says, I am the truth. And so wherever we can go and we can learn and we can say, God, please transform me by the renewing of my mind so that I will be able to know, no, 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 not N-O, but K-N-O-W, that I know. I know how to walk. I know why to walk. I know how. So that I don't go back. 
See, I, I sit and talk with men and women who, are, who want to go forward in their marriage. They want to go forward in their parenting. They want to go forward into forgiveness, but they don't know how. And somehow the church has settled for just observing instead of knowing. You know what I mean by observing? Like being a spectator of some kind of an entertainment system. That is not the church. God established the church and his word is central to it so that we would know the difference between right and wrong. So that we would know how to keep moving so that we know. And you know what? If you feel like, well, I don't know, well, then come and learn to know. And if you really need help and you want somebody to say, but I don't, I'm so confused, please help me, then come and get help to know. It matters what you think. It matters what you think. So what thoughts do you need to replace with biblical truth? Second thing, it matters what we do next, and that is the second one. By the way, what was the first one? Think. Think. Stop and think. Fear is... Think. Think. The second one is thank. Thank. Exodus 15, 2, by the way, um, we're going to read a couple of passages in Exodus 15, and it is actually the story of the Red Sea, which we, I know we didn't read yet, but it's the story of the Red Sea retold in song, okay, the crossing, the, but it's in song, and it says, Exodus 15 two says, the Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. I'll let him know how I feel about it. I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. I will thank him. I'll let it come out of me. Thank you for your faithfulness in the past. It doesn't, this looks impossible, but God, you did the impossible. Thank you for your faithfulness in the past. Thank you that you're with me like a strong tower all around me when I am afraid. Thank you that you are mighty to save when I am weak. Thank you that you give me everything I need for life and godliness. And the truth is, the more that I know you, the more that I know that you give me. Thank you. Ah, thank you. What does thanking do? See, I don't know. Sometimes I feel kind of like a broken record because if you asked me to stand up and teach like in a heartbeat, this would be my message. Because I believe that this is central to freedom. What does thanking do? It puts a fast stop to grumbling and complaining. Is there any of that happening in our world today? No grumbling, no complaining, no fear. Thanking God changes my heart. The circumstances, the Red Sea is still there. The army's still back there. But when I thank God, I remember truth, and I'm thinking on truth, and so I can thank him, and the two come together like crazy. Thank you. Now, please help. (laughs) Please help. And that's where we are in Exodus 14. Moses is, like, calling out for help. In verse 15, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Like, I don't, we won't even talk about that verse. Anyway, but the Israelites, I'm sorry, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord that when I gain uh, I'm sorry, when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Now, here's the deal. Sometimes don't you wish you would have God say, "Can you please just send me a text or something to let me know <laughs> what you're going to do 
Like, I would really like to know, God, what you're going to do about this situation. And also, I would really like to know specifically what you want me to do. Do you ever wish that? In this case, God specifically, thank you, Nathan. In this specific, in this case, God specifically said, here's what I'm going to do, and here, Moses, is what I want you to do. God gave him clear instructions. So let's keep reading, 19 to 20. Then the Lord, then the angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. So picture it. Here we go. The the angel of God was leading them, right? Now instead he went in behind him and the pillar of uh, behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other, so that neither went near the other all night long. What did God just do? What did he just give them? He gave them two things. One was protection and the other was time. They needed both. They needed both because they could not defend themselves against this army and they needed time to do what God gave them to do. And he gave them both of those things. Picking back up at verse 21. Then Moses stretched down his hand over the sea and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into, wait, into what? Into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. What did God do? He did what he said he would do. He did what he said he would do. Now, pause and remember. (laughs) This is not just a figurative story so that we understand how to continue to walk away from bondage. This is a fact of history, a true account about something that truly happened. And I am going to interject something here that's a little bit out of my comfort zone. I was telling Abby because I I feel like when I read about this miracle, I go, God, you did a miracle. And I believe that it's true. But I know that many mainline churches say it's not. And many men who would, and women who would say, I'm a, I'm a believer, say, no, it's not true. So I'm going to take a little bit of section and I'm going to time and I'm going to read some research that I've done. Why would I read it? Because I'm not very, uh, well, I'm, I was going to like bust on myself and say I'm not very smart. But these people that I'm going to read are way smarter. <laughs> and, so, and so I don't mess it up. I'm just going to read it. So you ready? First part is from the Journal of Creation, April 2016. Recent years have seen a new strategy by critics of Christianity. Listen closely, okay? Instead of simply dismissing all scripture, there appears to be a trend that accepts, listen, just enough of the Bible to satisfy a few Christians while denaturing it of the divine to satisfy fellow secularists. Instead of blatantly rejecting biblical history, some secularists are now explaining miracles as complex natural events. A recent example is the Red Sea crossing of Exodus 14. Oceanographers and atmospheric scientists have proposed natural explanations supported by mathematical models. Right, right, okay. Among them is Carl Drews, who told the Washington Post, you're like, Vicki, you researched into the Washington Post? Yes, sorry. Anyway, I did. Okay. He said, faith and science can be compatible. We can put them together if you are willing to consider other interpretations of the text. Which text is he talking about? The Bible. If you can, can, you know, other, other ideas of how this could have happened. In other words, don't take the word of God. This is my words. In other words, don't take the word of God as true for what it says. Interpret it some other way in order to believe that it's true. Drews has proposed that a 63-mile-per-hour wind blowing for 12 hours could have pushed back a wall of water, exposed a land bridge, and held it for the crossing. This effect called wind set down. 
The wind set down concept is somewhat more refreshing than the popular claim that the Israelites waded through a reed sea, inevitably leading to the joke about a little boy being amazed that God could drown the Egyptian army in six inches of water. These natural explanations of the Red Sea crossing fail in that they are inconsistent with the facts of the biblical narrative in three ways. At least, I've been thinking of all the ways that they're doing it, but three that we're going to look at this morning. The first one, in his explanation, 63 mile per hour wind and this and this and this, and then there's another explanation where the wind just came and piled the water up on one side, which, oh, we're, we're, I'm, I'm sorry, I wasn't going to talk too much in between. Here we go. First one is, where is God in their explanations? He's missing. God is missing from their explanations. Where is God in the biblical narrative? He is with them. He said what would happen, and he caused what he said would happen. God is the main character. So how do we know what to believe when we compare the biblical account with scientific models? I continue to quote, Addressing the relationship between the Bible and forensic history will depend on one's worldview. The Christian worldview constrains forensic history by the limited but true data in the biblical narrative. Okay? In other words, where the two seem to contradict, which one do we know is true? The believer in Christ, which one? We know that the Bible is true. So we say, well, you know, that's an explanation, but no, we're going to constrain it to what the Bible says. On the other hand, naturalism attempts to control the meaning of the narrative so that it is, conforms with science. In other words, where the two seem to contradict, science is the authority. Selective reading of the narrative, especially if God is excluded, is not helpful. Eliminating God's work in space and time from narratives that emphasize it is a philosophical choice, not a scientific one. So you and I need to settle in our minds. Who and what is our authority? Who and what is our authority? Second thing that's inconsistent with the biblical narrative. What was the condition of the Red Sea water at the time of crossing? Secular studies require a continuous, high-velocity wind set down to prevent the parted water from closing during the crossing. But the Bible indicates that once formed, the walls of water were miraculously held in place without wind. The wind was still blowing, but they weren't holding them in place. And we get that. It says that they appeared to congeal. Now, I looked up the word congeal because that is not a word I use every day. And basically, think jello. Okay. Exodus 15, 8, by the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. And I quote, natural events cannot comprehensively explain miracles. Even if God makes use of the natural means for part of the event. Exodus 14, 23, we'll see what he did, okay? The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and clouded the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving, and the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them. Oh, isn't that what he said he was going to do? The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back into its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward, toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen and the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. That was the condition of the crossing. The water was up. When they were through, the water came down. And that is inconsistent with, with what we're told in natural events. Okay, the third one. What about the condition of the ground in their explanation? 
quoting again. Another problem is the dry land Israel crossed. A firm, dry path would have been necessary to carry the load of so many people and animals, but that creates serious problems for naturalists. It requires more than the removal of overlying seawater to create dry land. It also requires suppression of rising groundwater from the strata beneath the seafloor, especially in a muddy lake bed where they proposed that it happen. Solid ground would have been even more necessary for the natural explanations to succeed because in both scenarios, Israel would have crossed in the face of near hurricane force headwinds, an impediment strangely unmentioned in the narrative. Secularists missed the main point. Nature did not drive the events. God did. He controlled it. Picking back up at Exodus 14:29, but the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground. And with the wall of water on the right and all on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. So when they went through, this is interesting, and I want you to say, because I, I just told you to think, right? Now I am not telling you not to think, right? Because we, we know that there are some things that we can think about, and we know from how things work what it works. So here's an example. I'll just say it, okay? When we picture because of movies, the way movies portray, how wide was that opening, it was just a narrow, so it's like, whoa, whoa. Well, there was two and a half million people plus animals and stuff. It had to be wide for them to get through in one night. So we can figure that there was not this tiny little shoot of an opening, but more than a mile of an opening so that a thousand people could walk shoulder to shoulder with their stuff and make it through in one night. That God made a way. He made a way. He stood the water up like a wall. Is this the first time that God ever used the wind and the sea? That he ever controlled it as if he was God of it? Is this the last time? Is this the only time? No, you're probably thinking of all kinds of times when they crossed the Jordan, when Jesus stopped as though the wind and the sea obeyed him. He stopped the storm with the word. God, God is the God of miracles and he can do anything he wants. Here we go. A warning. A warning. And I want to read this from the article, from an article in Answers to Genesis. In Genesis, I'm sorry. We must be careful to avoid limiting our faith to only those acts of God that we can explain according to the laws of the physical world. He miraculously created those physical laws and he can miraculously use them to, or override them as he chooses. If, this is crucial, so listen to this, if the Red Sea crossing was just a rare natural event, scripture is wrong, both in the immediate narrative and in its broader context. If one part is wrong, then any other part can be too. Men and women, why did I spend this time? Because we need to decide what we believe. Who is the authority? What we can explain? Or God. If he says he did it, do you believe him? Because if you believe it here, then you will believe it elsewhere. And not because of your belief, but because it's true. It's not true because we believe it. We believe it because it's true. Now, I'm done with that part. Let's get back to the point. Of today. When the Red Sea's there and the army's coming from there, what do we do first? Think. Think. What do we do first? Think. Think. I don't want you to forget that word. When you feel that fear and anger, think. Second thing, Think. Think. Think truthfully about the bondage and the God who freed you. Thank. Thank God for all he has done and is doing to give you freedom from it. But truthfully, where are we still standing? 
<laughs> you're not quite yet. Because right now, what they're, they, we're going to be in the middle of the sea. They're standing on the edge of the sea. What do they have to, what has to happen next? They have to do. The word is do. Think, thank, do. Think, thank, do. Sorry for those of you ladies who came to mom to mom. This was our like mantra last year. You're like, oh, here we go again. Think, thank, do. You know what? When COVID hit and the world went a little nuts, I was like, okay, God, now it's time for me to put practice what I teach. Think, thank, do. What do you want me to think? What do you want me to be thankful for? What do you want me to do? Do is huge. If we don't do, we stay standing on the edge of the land. We don't walk. We don't keep moving away from freedom. So God gave them their freedom from Egypt. Who did it? God did it. And when Egypt pursued them to put them back into bondage, just like our bondage always pursues us. Why? Because it was for freedom that Jesus set you free. And who is against that freedom? Satan, the enemy of your soul, the enemy of your marriage, the enemy of your family, the real enemy is going to pursue you to draw you back. The enemy of your purity is going to pursue you. The enemy of your freedom will always pursue you. But God, but God did something. What did God do? He made a way, right? He made a way for escape. God did that. But just, I'm sorry, I just spit on you. Pause for a second and imagine this story. If God, God did something, right? Who did it? God did it. But what if God was the only one that did in this story? Is God the only one that did anything in this story? No. What did Moses do? Did Moses do anything? Yes. Moses did some. Here's what Moses was told to do. Tell the Israelites to move on. Use your mouth. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea. And then again, he was told, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters will flow back over the Egyptians. Question, why, why would God ask Moses to do something? Did, is God not capable of doing it on his own? We know good and well that God could have done this whole entire thing without Moses doing one thing. Right? Right? Nothing is impossible for him. He's not, oh man, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Oh, I know what. I'll just ask Moses to put his hand down and that'll be the answer. Why did God include Moses and why did God ask him to do those things? Or imagine if Moses was like, oh man, these people annoy me like crazy. Look what I just done. I just gave my whole life for them. And now they're yelling at me. I'm not just, God, I don't need this. But the fact is, God did give Moses something to do. And the fact is also that Moses did obey God. He did his part. He did his part. Who parted the Red Sea? God. What did Moses do? Obeyed. Obeyed God. That's all he did. He obeyed God. Did he part the Red Sea? No, he put up his hand. He did his part. All he did was obey. God is the one that does the work. But we obey and we do what he gives us to do. What did the people do? What if, what if they're standing there afraid? God, why? Oh, okay, we're going to think. We're going to think. Oh, look, a mile wide opening in the sea. God, thank you for providing that for us. We're so grateful. Would that be their freedom? Think, thank do they got to start walking what if way, the way would have opened up or they just stood there or they said well too bad god you did that for us but we're back in egypt no they had to walk god made a way but they had to take it they had to walk down into the valley of the sea they had to trust god enough to take their thought captives to stop grumbling and to walk away from the lying memory of Egypt, away from it, away from the cell, and to take step after step, 
How long? All night long. They had to keep walking. See, it is, has been, and I don't know why exactly, but it's God's plan through, since creation to give us a part of what he is doing. Not because he needs us to do it, but because he wants us to participate in what he's doing. To participate in the freedom that he gives us. He does his part, and we do our part. Our part. Colossians. Let's look back there. I love this because I love the way it says it. Colossians 1.10. Oh, so good. Remember, we're praying that we have the right knowledge, that the Spirit gives us knowledge and wisdom and understanding, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good, good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Now, I like Bible study, so let's look back at that verse. In your mind or with your pen, underline the things that we are doing, okay? Let's read it. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. What word are we underlining? Live. Live. We are going to live. You're like, well, I'm alive. That's not the same thing. It's like I'm going to live a life worthy of the Lord. And I'm going to please him. I'm going to please him in every way. And I'm going to bear fruit in every good work. And I'm going to be strengthened with all power. I'll keep reading. According to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and peace. And giving thankful, oh, I'm sorry, patience. Sorry about that. And giving thankful, oh, listen to this. Huh, this is interesting. Huh. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. To share in it, to participate in it, to be a part of it. That's what he's doing. And now I'm almost done. This is all very interesting. Hopefully it was interesting. It was to me. What are the three things we're doing? We need to thank and do. Think, thank, do. And I don't care what situation you're in. I don't care what relationship you're in. I don't care what condition. Anything in your life is in. If you stop and you say, okay, God, I will think biblically. I will thank you for what you're doing and continue to do. And I will do what you ask me to do. Think, thank, do. So what is he telling you to do? What's he telling you to do in order to experience the freedom that he gave you? This isn't theory. This is life. Is he telling you to take another step away from the addiction and the temptation that pulls you back there? Is he telling you to soften your heart and forgive the hurt that's been done against you? What will you do? Is he telling you to humble yourself and say the healing words that the broken relationship needs? In regard to your fear, is he telling you step out in faith? Even though you are still afraid, it is a lie that we move after our fear goes away. No, we move when we are afraid. Hiding in your cell is not what God has for you. Is he telling you to intentionally invest in what's up there ahead of you instead of what's back there? And to what is eternal instead of what you can see? And that's going to mean an intentional investment in a healthy future. Time getting to know your Savior. Exercising self-control. Resisting gratification and the emotions that control you. So, Red Sea, Army, what do we do? Three things. Think, thank, do. That's how you participate. 
I only have one more question. Is he worthy? Is he? Then let's do it. Let's not just be observers. Let's not just be casually adding Christianity to our life and then we do whatever we want. No, we participate in the glorious inheritance that we have been given and we participate by thinking. We participate by thanking and we participate by doing what he gives us to do because he's worthy. Because he's worthy. Let's pray. Before I pray, I would like you to pray to the God that gave you your freedom. And if there is something that you need to work on in terms of thinking or thanking or doing, talk to him about that thing. Respond to his word. Father God, I know that you, that these people in this room, that you laid down your life for us. And you did that so that we could have freedom from the things that control us and the things that dictate us, our lives, to do what is not what you had in mind for us. God, I pray that you would help us to remember these three little roles that we have, these things that we can do. And I thank you that you have done all the rest. It is for freedom that you set us free. Now, I pray that when we walk out of here, no matter what the circumstances of our life, that we would live free. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week.